So I just want to talk first about um, the neurological manifestations of uh, EDS, and uh, there's a lot written on this topic. Uh, actually, surprisingly little compared to what's coming out, and I suspect in the next while there'll be much more to describe to you. But this is a paper from Child's Nervous System, one of the journals that I, I typically read, and it really talks about some of these manifestations. Uh, to some degree today, some of what I talk about will be an overlap with what Dr. Gordon has talked about and what Dr. Henderson will be talking about, what Dr. Colby has talked about, but I don't think that's bad. I think sometimes repetition is actually good for um, an audience such as, as you. So I've listed there uh, some of the um, classifications, the different types of EDS, not to look at that because this is from 2000. 11-ish, and you've heard from Dr. Pridmore, 2012, and now 2016 classifications are coming out, so you can definitely keep your eyes open for the new classification systems. Uh, for the neurological manifestations, these are some of the things about which I'll be speaking, and these are the main uh, neurological manifestations, so headache, uh, cerebral vascular issues, chronic pain syndrome, you've heard from Dr. Gordon already about neuropathy, Cerebral malformations is something that hasn't been talked about yet today. I'll spend some time on that. Epilepsy, I've min mentioned to a degree. Uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension, which was uh, spoken about. And then uh, I'll speak very briefly about craniovertebral ligamentous laxity, but uh, Dr. Henderson will be speaking more about that uh, later in, in this um, con conference. So headache. So in EDS, the headaches are diverse. There's no question. And we see examples of... Um, of people who have migraines, tension, stress, and cluster headaches. Um, the differential diagnosis of headache is very long. It's a long, long list, and uh, in my clinics I see many children referred to me who have Chiari malformations, who have headaches of unknown etiology, and we have to sort out what type of headache uh, falls into. In the context of EDS, we don't know what the uh, pathogenesis, that means the cause of the headaches is in most cases, but Possibly post-traumatic, the connective tissue laxity, repetitive trauma, those are possible mechanisms by which uh, headaches could occur. Also, for more migrainous type headaches, the cerebrovascular arterial reactivity is something that is seen and uh, can help to explain that. And uh, migraine sufferers in general may be prone to stroke, something you uh, may or may not know about. Cerebrovascular system, so for those um, patients who have the uh, vascular form of EDS, this can be a real serious deal. And I've seen some children at SickKids, I've helped to treat some, where they've had uh, aneurysms and they've had other types of vascular problems, dissections of the blood vessels. That means when there's a, a break in the wall and blood can um, spontaneously track along the vessel wall itself or outside in the case of aneurysms. And these are very, very tough uh, situations to treat in the context of EDS. And um, nowadays, there's more interventional neurosurgery being done, meaning that um, you have uh, these coils, these dilators, these implants that are placed uh, transvascularly to uh, treat these conditions as opposed to doing open cranial procedures or open spinal procedures. And I think that's been a great benefit. But even in the, in the context of EDS, the vascular punctures can be really problematic and, and can lead to some problems. But that whole technology is moving forward, and as I said, the Provincial Neurosurgery Ontario program played a big role in getting the coils and embolic material into practice in Ontario because we were sorely lacking in some of those technologies. And then stroke and, uh, and then the vascular form can also be a, a source of a headache in some patients. Neuropathy, as, as I mentioned, Dr. Gordon's already covered this and um, could involve the arm, that means the brachial, or the lumbosacral, that means uh, coming down the leg, plexuses, and um, the mechanism is not well understood, as you heard this morning. And so there are a number of tests that can be used to try to make this uh, diagnosis of neuropathy, but it usually comes down to neurophysiological tests, such as EMGs, which stands for electromyograms, or N NCS here stands for nerve uh, conduction studies and what the role of repeated dislocations and subluxations play in the genesis of these neuropathies is uh, not quite uh, clear. Other neuromuscular alterations, uh, again, a sensory motor polyneuropathy, myopathies, um, myofascial force transmission alterations, uh, other things uh, that we see. Um, typically, the creatinine kinase levels are normal in patients that have EDS. So it's not a primary muscle issue. We've already talked about, well, how does a 
gene defect in collagen cause muscle and nerve alterations, and there's probably some interplay between the collagen and the, um, the nerve coatings or even the muscle uh, coating fibers that relate to uh, these alterations that can occur in the neuromuscular system. This was mentioned earlier, and uh, to some degree, it's, it's becoming more an increasingly better recognized um, complication of EDS, but also in the general population, and that is CSF leaks. And there are a number of dural defect type syndromes. So some of the connective tissue uh, disorders, including EDS, but others uh, that I've seen, like uh, Marfan's and uh, some of the other uh, connective tissue diseases, will lead to these defects in the dura that then allow for a spinal fluid to leak through the dura, uh, collecting in the extra dural space that can then lead to um, a uh, intracranial hypotension, low uh, cranial pressure syndrome. And this MRI scan is uh, showing you a picture of the an axial MRI scan. You can see the here the arrow pointing at what's one of the common features, which is uh, enhancement around the uh, margins of the of the cortex of the brain that indicates that there's um, a, a low uh, cranial pressure problem. But on top of that, there are other features that can be used to make this diagnosis of CSF leak on MRI scan. But it can be problematic. Can be hard and one of the uh, treatments for this is blood patching, as, uh, as you may know. And sometimes one blood patch isn't enough. You have to have uh, multiple blood patches. Sometimes uh, you need really invasive uh, imaging studies like CT myelography. Uh, but usually MRI scan is sufficient to try to point out where the leak is coming from and, uh, and whether or not a blood patch will do or whether you'll need to have a surgical repair. And I've repaired some. Uh, dural leaks like this where we've seen what the problem is in the context of uh, children who have had connective tissue disorders. Okay, epilepsy. So um, I don't know how many in the room may be problem um, affected by epilepsy, but it is uh, a higher percentage than in the, in the regular population. And um, what the role is, for example, of some maneuvers that are done um, that might alter the blood flow to the brain in generating epilepsy uh, is not clear. But in, in general, there are, is a slightly higher percentage of um, people with EDS that have uh, these malformations that can cause um, epilepsy in the, in the population. So one of them is called nodular heterotopia, and there's a, a, a whole variety of other uh, cortical malformations that can occur in EDS, uh, slightly higher than in the general population. I do a lot of epilepsy surgery at SickKids, and um, I can't recall, however, operating yet on a, on a child with uh, EDS. Okay, pain was already mentioned, so I won't spend much time talking about this, but just to iterate again, the uh, hypermobility dislocation, repetitive trauma type of uh, pain generator that uh, many of you in this uh, room have uh, suffered. And other manifestations listed here, the atlantal occipital, uh, atlantal axial instability, which Dr. Colby mentioned, which Dr. Henderson will go into in more detail. Uh, kyphoscoliosis, so disorders, deformities of the spine, uh, these meningeal cysts that I've seen and treated before in children, uh, polymicrogyres, another uh, cerebral malformation that can occur, slightly higher in incidence in EDS, chronic fatigue syndrome, Dr. Gordon mentioned, and orthostatic uh, intolerance, of course, will be um, a topic of another lecture today. I just want to mention this paper. This is probably one of the first papers that came out. It was really important because it um, described uh, patients that have these uh, connective tissue disorders that had Chiari malformation and the role that uh, surgery plays in trying to help this, uh, this population. I know you can't read this from the back, but basically uh, this is not um, completely about EDS, but includes other um, connective tissue disorders, including Marfan's and others. Uh, but look at the list of symptoms that are, are here and signs, and, and there are myriad. There are so many different things that can be related to a Chiari malformation and that would require the attention of uh, a professional like a neurosurgeon to help uh, take care of. The diagnosis of cranial vertebral anomalies is challenging at times. Uh, cranial settling is a disorder that can be diagnosed by the techniques that Dr. Colby mentioned. Uh, the gliding of the occipital condyles, um, which is the connection between the skull and the first cervical vertebrae can be measured um, when there's movement occurring, both um, flexion and extension. So there are many, many different ways to do this. I thought I would just uh, provide for you in the last few slides a primer on how the spine actually 
works. We've seen the radiology of the spine, but these are some of the anatomical images of the cervical spine. So as Dr. Colby mentioned, you have at the very top um, C1 here, which is called the atlas because it's holding up the world like Atlas did. And then you have the axis, which is C2, which is here you can see the odontoid process here. And then the other spinal uh, bones are similar in appearance, but they are slightly different in their size. They're separated by these discs that you see here. They also have these processes that go out the side that are called the transverse processes. And going up through a hole in the transverse process is a, a foramen, that's an opening called the foramen transversarium which allows for the vertebral artery, which is one of the main arteries that supplies the brain stem and uh, critical structures of the brain. And with hyperextension, with rot severe rotation of the neck, that particular artery can be uh, challenged and that can lead to stroke in some patients, including patients that have uh, EDS. Other anatomical images here that you can see, this is the uh, spine looking from the front. On the left, on the right, the spine looking from behind, and as surgeons, we know this anatomy uh, quite, because uh, uh, we see it quite regularly, we know it cold. Uh, but just to show you that, um, now this is looking basically at the front of the spine. You can see the, the ribs at the bottom that are curving around, uh, but just show you the deep muscles that are attached to the spine that keep the spine in order. And then there are a whole series of ligaments that bind the spine together that, um, must be kept in place to avoid um, pain and also to avoid uh, s um, subluxations and dislocations. And it's a very, very complicated uh, structure. This is now looking from behind and you're seeing the muscles at the top, at the back of the skull here that basically are holding the uh, skull to the spine. These, this is called the suboccipital musculature and then uh, the myriad of different muscles that attach the, uh, the spine. But uh, interspersed with the muscles are, of course, all these ligaments that can get um, challenged in the context of EDS that can lead to uh, pain syndromes and uh, laxity, as I mentioned. I'm just going to spend just a moment, because uh, I know Dr. Henderson is going to uh, talk more about this, of the different measuring lines that can be used. And I think whenever you see that there's like five or six different measurement strategies to do one thing, that is to make a diagnosis of instability, you know that one system isn't good enough, and so they've invented system number two and then three and four and five. So there are all these lines on the lower right hand side that you can see here, McCray, Wackenheims, McGregor, Chamberlain's, etc. There's a bunch of them that are used to help us understand when there's a problem at the base of the skull that requires a neurosurgical's attention. And I've uh, listed those there for you. But here's an example of McCray's line that is an older measurement. And basically here you're looking at side view as Dr. Colby had mentioned at the very tip here of um, this is called the clivus. This is part of the skull that comes down. And you're measuring from here to here, which is the, uh, the back of the frame and magnum. And this measurement here, uh, if this, uh, which is the process of C2, the odontite process goes above that line, that's indicative of basilar invagination, which is seen in cranial settling, <coughs> seen in uh, patients that have uh, EDS. Here's Chamberlain's line, which is drawing a line from the hard palate that you can see here to the back of the frame and magnum and as on the x-ray, the CT scan here, you can see the odontoid process going above that line indicative of the measurement that uh, the radiologists make to tell us that there's uh, basilar invagination. Another line, I won't go into detail here, just measuring slightly different parameters and so on. And then finally this uh, line which is um, to measure the um, what's called the retropulsion of the odontoid process. So the odontoid process on the sagittal view here is seen here. And if it curves backwards, which is sometimes seen in Chiari malformation, and it impinges on the brain stem, that can be a sign that uh, something needs to be done about it. And there's a new measurement line here called the PBC2 line that has come into play that is used to look at the measurement of the retropulsion of the odontoid process towards the brainstem. It mostly affects patients that have uh, carry malformation. <clears throat> so just to, uh, to wrap up the presentation, um, I've discussed many of the manifestations that affect the uh, nervous system in EDS. I've talked about uh, the pain uh, syndromes that can occur, headache. I think repetitive trauma and ligamentous laxity is clearly a role and um, to do dynamic studies, as, as was mentioned in the previous uh, lecture, is uh, critically important, I think, at these very difficult um, cases that need to be sorted out. And so uh, we do um, 
We try to do flexion extension plane films in uh, patients who have had trauma, for example, at, at SickKids Hospital around the world. Actually, that's uh, a test that's done. Um, and uh, the, the discussion about the upright MRI scan is something that we had a, a breakfast session about this morning. Uh, so uh, we're all kind of interested in getting that technology in Toronto, as, uh, as I hope that you all know. Uh, cerebral malformations, I uh, talked about briefly epilepsy, which uh, can occur at slightly higher frequency. Uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension is becoming a very important cause of headache and uh, one that's very difficult at times to sort out. And then finally, um, as we understand more about uh, the conditions that affect um, people with EDS, I'm sure that we'll work out some of the mechanisms and the manifestations that are, are causing them. So that I'll conclude. We'd be happy to take any questions, but thanks again for the invitation to be here today. Thank you.